Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Covenant Church of Thomaston on this uh, cold and uh, wintry day, our first winter, and a uh, great day, amazing yesterday with those uh, snowflakes that were coming down the size of silver dollars. That was kind of beautiful, wasn't it? Uh, kind of off to a good, good start here. Uh, we have a uh, few announcements this morning. I know, Antoinette, do you have like to make something about the poinsettias? Um, yes. Poinsettias, I need to know by the middle of this week if you would like one and you can pay me later. I just need to know so I can get them from the floor. Twelve dollars. And we're also looking for counters for um, after the service. Okay, uh, we had a couple announcements this morning. Uh, first of all, we have these booklets here, the uh, Peace and Promise of Christmas. Uh, Ten-day reflections are up front, they're in the back. Please grab one for the holiday here. Uh, and Ryan discussed that they had 26 to 30 ditty bags done, and she was very helpful and thankful for that. That was a a good thing that we need to celebrate and uh, Kathy Friedland has a couple of things that the first service wiped out there was a lot of them but they love them so there are three pillowcases left and they are done by uh, women from girls, girls from Guatemala and they make they get three dollars for them and uh, they don't get paid until they're sold. So there's three, three left, uh, $15 a piece. So they would look great on one of your beds. So help her out today. They, I think she had about 20 this morning, but the first service loved them. Uh, there will be a diaconate meeting this afternoon at 11.30. And there will also be a, a quarterly business meeting next week. So mark that down on your calendar. Anything else anyone else would like to mention or bring up this morning? Okay, we're doing good. Okay, let us now stand for our uh, Come Lord Jesus. to come and lead us in our call to worship and candlelight. Light this candle as a sign of the coming light of Christ. Advent means coming. We are preparing ourselves for the days where the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf, the lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Let us walk in the light of the Lord.
please. Good morning, Father. What an amazing snow we had before us yesterday. What an amazing day we have before us today to spend time together, to share in communion, and to worship you. On this second Sunday of Advent, we will hear of your servant crying to us out in the wilderness. We will hear that you are offering forgiveness of sins. We will hear of your mercy spoken over us. We will hear of your baptizing with water and with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Cleanse us and make us new. We will hear of you ushering in the reign of peace and we'll hear of your kingdom when it comes. God, our sins are many, but our mercy, your mercy is great. Our vision is dim, but your coming is at hand. Our hope is feeble, but your promises stand forever. God, with all that's going on around us in our lives and in us and in the world, we are in need of you in every way. Everywhere we look, we are in need of you. We look for your coming, your restoration, your peace, and your transformation. To the glory of your name, we pray the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. reading is from the book of Psalms, chapter 92, verses 12 to 15, and that's on page 478 in your pew Bible. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. In old age, they still produce fruit. They are always green and full of sap showing that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. And our second reading is from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, and that's page 812 in your pew Bible. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thongs of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And this is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Would you join your hearts with me in our call to confession? 
Remember that our Lord Jesus can sympathize with us in our weaknesses, since in every respect he was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then come with boldness to approach the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now let us join for silence as we bring our confessions to the Lord. God of grace and truth, in Jesus Christ you came among us as light shining in darkness. We confess that we have not welcomed the light or trusted good news to be good. We have closed our eyes to glory in our midst, expecting little and hoping for less. Forgive our doubt and renew our hope so that we may receive the fullness of your grace and live in the truth of Christ the Lord. Amen. God says in so many ways, there is nothing you can do to make me stop loving you. When the truth of those words breaks through, we are transformed. We don't have to carry around the burdens of our past. We are a new creation through the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit who has become our companion and the one who nurtures us and binds us together. Thanks be to God. Amen. All right, kids, come on. <laughs> All girls? Oh, that's great. <laughs> awesome. You guys are awesome. Let's say a quick prayer, okay? Thank you so much for these girls.
so why should I of that song to just kind of flow all over you because the words just are so, so perfect for what I'm saying here today. Back in the fall, Pastor Tim gave the lay pastors in me a schedule of upcoming sermons and texts and themes. And I eagerly looked for my date in scripture and mine said December 6th. Yay. Advent 2, second week of Advent. Yay. And then it said, getting ready for the end to come. And I was like, really? That's what I'm, what? And normally hearing the end is sad, right? A story ends, a favorite series on TV ends, a relationship ends, and there's an end of an era, or the saddest of all, the end of a life. But for today, let's change our perspective and think of the end as pure joy. Getting ready being the important part, for it is the title of this homily, and the end meaning the end of a pandemic, the end of suffering, the end of trials, the end of loneliness, and for us in three weeks, the end of 2020. Praise you, God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful place and this space and this time and these people whom you've gathered together. Lord, I pray a special blessing on the hearing of these words and the meditations of my heart. And I ask for you to make me little and for you to be big. In Jesus' name, amen. So today's gospel text introduces us to a strange man. He is a messenger, a witness, the forerunner of the end of waiting for the Messiah. He is John the baptizer. He's the son of Elizabeth, the Virgin Mary's cousin, who Mary visited and stayed with when she herself found she was pregnant with Jesus. Well, Elizabeth was old, beyond childbearing years, yet had this baby boy named John. And the second Sunday of Advent, and in our text from Mark, we hear a description of John. He lives in the wilderness near the Jordan River. He was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. However, the primary intention of John was not to draw attention to himself, himself as weird as it was, but to point to the one who was more powerful coming after me, it says in verse 7. Now, John's baptism is preparatory in anticipation for the coming of the Messiah. His baptism of repentance and forgiveness is a call to the people to turn from their godless ways and receive the forgiveness that is present in Yahweh. And it is what we are to be about now, especially during Advent. So before I change the course of this talk, point one is to be honest about your sins. Some people say have sort short sin accounts. And what that's saying is each day kind of be aware of your sins and keep your account short that you won't have that many things to. So when Pastor Liz had us be praying in silence, hopefully you didn't have a whole lot more time you needed because you were all prayed up, right? And I love this. Um, to be honest about sin is to live in your body with integrity. Wouldn't that feel good to live in our body that has no sin? and is full of integrity. And since it's soon Christmas and the end of the year, it's time to take stock of mistakes, the bad, the sin, and give it over to the Lord and commit to turning away from that. It's only with the Holy Spirit we can be able to do it. Now, the word Advent means the arrival of a notable person, thing, or event. 
Or in Christian theology, Advent means the coming or second coming of Christ. So for today's text, getting ready for the end to come is very good news indeed. It's supposed to be exciting, this culmination of the end of waiting for the promise of baby Jesus then, and for us now, for Jesus to come again and to make a new heaven and new earth. Now, I know what you're thinking, the same thing I always thought, but wait, I still want to live this life. All my fun stuff, my accomplishments, my future, my family goals and dreams that haven't happened yet. So as wonderful as eternity will be, I would like time to progress naturally and life to be lived here on earth as it is. Thank you very much. Now, at 55 years old, life is still a blast, despite setbacks and trials in a global pandemic. And most thrilling of all is watching Elsie and Addie grow. It's true what they say, young people, the best is yet to come. Now, over the past couple of months, I was asked by a few different people in this church, next time you preach, they said, will you teach about growing older, about being relevant, about recognizing our calling in all phases of our lives? But I worried and wondered if my assigned text for my next turn to stand here before you would lend itself to these. However, John the Baptist's role is that of a servant to the one he's called to serve, right? And this is where we all come in. Let's apply John's role or his calling to our lives and to this time of year. Look at verse 7 again where it says, the John, Bapt John the Baptizer says, After me comes the one more powerful than I. So John's job was to point to Jesus. And I don't believe the end of the world is within my lifetime or imminent. Some of you may say it, it is coming, but I don't, I don't think we're going to see that happening, at least in my old age. However, the collective calling and our individual command by God is to point others to Jesus. So trust me when I tell you there is no greater purpose under heaven than to live a life worthy of glorifying God by pointing to people in your circle of influence to the knowledge about and relationship with their Savior and Creator, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. So since the youngest among us is growing older each day, it is relevant and appropriate to prepare all of us for aging. I am, in fact, an expert in this field. I've been working on it, studying it, observing it, and practicing it all of my life. My best teachers were my grandparents. They all lived until their mid to late 90s, so longevity runs in my family. And each one of them served God differently in their churches and in their lives. Pa, my dad's dad, was the church sign and lettering man. And today, when Ann Ryan walked in for early service, she handed me um, the voices thing. And look at what is pictured. The sign my grandfather painted. And I was had it in my sermon today. Salem Covenant Church in Washington Depot. There is the sign. And to this day, it's still what he did, what he painted. So that was really cool timing. And all of the... Um, Things, all, the, all the rooms in the church at Bethlehem Covenant Church, he painted, and the carpentry within those walls, and to this day, they still boast his talents in every room. And Grandma Sundell, his wife, was the cook and craftsperson extraordinaire. And she also cared for all the girls and women till her death. And thinking back on her life, I believe my connection to teenagers might be from her. My mother's parents served their church in Trimont, Minnesota. Grandma Parison was the official local grandma to all the pastor's kids in that church for over 70 years of her 94 years. She was happiest with the little ones. My mom's dad, Arthur John Pearson, served by attending every event and sat quietly and gratefully in the church pew. And as far as I know, that is the full extent of his ministry. But showing up matters, and he did that until he died at 92. Their daughter, LaVon Carolyn Pearson Sundell, died at the age I will be in a few months. However, my mother lived her best life now, each one of her 56 years, often saying with glee, this has to be the best stage of life. 
So this is teaching point number two, friends. No matter your age or stage, live it to the fullest and brightest, not looking back with regret or remorse, not looking ahead longing for what might still come, but exist in the right now with pleasure and gratitude and applause. My mom loved people. She made the person she was with the most important person. She was focused, interested, and caring. When my mom died, I wrestled with God, saying she worked for you and her life pointed to you. Why allow her to leave us so young? He immediately responded deep in my mind and heart, saying, He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I didn't know where that came from until I looked it up. It's Philippians 1, 6. And I understood this to mean that my mother's work, her purpose, her calling was completed for her lifetime. She did everything she was purposed to do for the kingdom. I didn't like that since my and Ulrich were only three and one. And to me, she should have been allowed to remain until they were much older and for her to meet Elsie and Addie. But in God's economy, she completed the good work she was born to do. And who am I to call God unfair? As God said to Job in Job 38, Were you there when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? And on it goes. So no, I don't need to understand the ways of God. He gave me my good mother and he took her away. And here I am proclaiming at the age she was when she died, prepare the way of the Lord for he is coming. Growing older is like being called into a country we don't know how to navigate, but God beckons us there says Reverend Will Williman. He goes on to tell the story about a man who wrote to him saying, Pastor, I'm going into justice work because of you. Pastor Williman wrote back saying, what did I do back then to cause you to go into the work of justice? The man responded, when I was eight years old, before you gave me the bread and the cup during communion, you said, Rob, receive the body and blood of Jesus. <laughs> That was it. And the man went on to say, you said my name. I felt known and valued. So now I will pursue justice so that others will be known and valued. And the point is, Jesus tells us, give me what you've got and I'll work out the rest. Just knowing someone's name and seeing them matters. All followers of Jesus, we surrender our life and will to him, giving all we have, our intelligence, our personality, our experiences, our pain, our suffering, our motives, and he will use it for his glory. Everything we are, including our struggles, and he will turn them into assignments. Nothing is wasted. I had a breakthrough the other day. I was on my walk listening to a podcast and I realized how and why I've been called to be a youth leader. I've been wondering why I haven't been called out to stop this ministry even though I'm an old grandmother. But when I was a teenager at Salem Covenant Church in Washington Depot, they didn't have a youth ministry. It was me and Tracy Trowbridge, my brother Tim and Laura Fox. That was it. I lived my abundant life from one retreat to the next in Camp Squano in the summer. That was all I had. It was a massive void for me. <laughs> but this severe need in me is now met. I've been able to partake in youth ministry for over 30 years. Talk about abundance. How good is God? It filled the need in me and has met this same need in by now over hundreds of others, even if they didn't realize they needed it. We serve a faithful and generous God. The disciples only had five loaves of bread and two fish, yet God turned it into a feast for thousands with leftovers. So he will take what we give him and he will multiply it for the good of those around us. Is there a ministry in church you might want to, to be partake in, but maybe you don't feel motivated or equipped to serve? 
Give God what you do have, and he will do the rest. Will Williman said, when you do good work, it's not promised you'll love it at first, but being called to serve, that is the greatest joy. He goes on to say, every stage of life is for the sake of others. Friends, as we age, in any age, our legacy is in serving God, in church or in community. The beautiful thing is the God who calls helps us turn experience into a calling. And every person is summoned to something greater than ourselves. And depending on how many years on earth we have, we may have many different callings throughout those years. John the baptizer didn't live long, so his mission was to pave the way for Jesus, to cry out, prepare the way of the Lord by telling the people of his day to repent and be baptized. Aging is a moral test. Are we willing to use our experiences, our mistakes, our growing list of years lived and learned to further God's mission to love and support and encourage others? We can adjust to our changing, aging bodies and, and, and our limitations and still witness to the resurrection. Still pray for people, still partake in community. God does not ask us to do anything he's not able to equip us for. Now in closing, my dad is old now. He isn't the same as he once was with a bout of thyroid cancer and normal wear and tear from an athletic career in high school and bike trips he took across New England while serving two covenant churches, one in Milford, Massachusetts and one in Washington Depot. He had his fair share of grief. He lost his wife of 34 years when he was only 55, and he's been trying to booster his grief-stricken son and daughter over these past two and a half decades. He's a writer. He wrote the curriculum that the state of New Hampshire uses for refugee resettlement into the United States. And as a doctor of psychotherapy, he served as head of the Medical Ethics Committee, deciding who gets to keep their license and whose will be revoked when disciplinary actions were taken against them. He is a furniture builder, a house restorer, an alto in the Covenant Minister's European Choir Tours, and he knows his way around Israel, having been several times. Today at 81, the Reverend Dr. David Sundell works full-time as a pastoral counselor, having more than 20 patients each week, meeting them regularly face-to-face -face using his computer. Don't tell me old people can't become proficient in today's technology. He is the pastor of his church in Massachusetts. He leads Bible study each week, preaches Sunday mornings, and visits the sick, driving up and back five hours round trip, including yesterday during that giant-sized uh, snowflake storm. It was bad. It was really bad driving up there, and um, I'm happy to report after much blood, sweat, and tears on my part, he got home safely. Now, I know he won't be able to keep up this madness too many more years, and I also know most people his age have retired. And I don't tell you this story to put anyone to shame if they don't keep up with this crazy schedule. I am his own offspring, and I can never compete with his level of intelligence and accomplishments. I am merely proclaiming that God is not finished with any of us yet. No matter your age, you are relevant, you are needed, and you matter. So moving forward and getting ready for 2021, how can we come alongside you to bring your best to the Lord? I'm grateful to God for my elders, my parents, and my grandparents. Their collective lives and servants to our Lord and kingdom is impressive. But my third point is this, and I want to leave you focused on one of my ancestors, and it's not my dad. It's the one who left no footprint. Very little exists anymore of anything he made, wrote, said, wore, or did. My brother and I have no items that belong to him. There are very few photos of him. Our mother's father left little behind, but he loved Jesus. He showed up, he carried his Bible, and he sat and he listened. My Uncle Jim spent an hour sharing the memories he had of him from his house in Nebraska. Grandpa Art Pearson never prayed out loud. After church, he ran to his car waiting for everyone else to head home, never complaining in the waiting. 
He never said, I love you, to anyone. He was not the spiritual head of their household. But once he said to his son, Jim, if you go on a date on a Wednesday or a Sunday, be sure you take her to church or don't date on those nights. My point is God and community of believers was his priority for 92 years. So I can hold that close. And I'm proud of you, Grandpa. You mattered. You were an example to follow. You did your best with what you were given. Now, I know COVID has messed up countless things for us, but God. Be faithful because God is faithful. Praise God because he is worthy of praise. Open your Bibles because he is the author. And get ready for what's next. Amen. It is now our sacred privilege to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. All who humbly put their trust in Christ and desire his help, that they may be led, that they may lead a holy life. All who are truly sorry for the sins and would be delivered from them. All who would walk in love with their neighbors and intend to live a new life. Following the commandments of God and walking from now on in his holy ways are invited to draw near with faith. 
than to receive the holy sacraments. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. Many will come from the east and the west and from the north and the south and sit at the table of the kingdom of God. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust in him to share the feast he has prepared. According to Luke, whom our, when our risen Lord was at the table with his disciples, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Please let us stand now for our affirmation of faith found in back your hymnal on 878. I believe in God, God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Please be seated. Hear these words from the Lord Jesus Christ as they were delivered by the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord what I handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the loaf of bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim Christ until he comes again. You bow in prayer. O Lord of all, we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. Gracious God, we pray that you will send your Holy Spirit on these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and the blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son under his death and resurrection that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ. And bring us to that heavenly feast where, with all your saints, we will be gathered in glory everlasting through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now as we partake, just a reminder, everybody on my left, go left. Everybody on the right in the sanctuary, go that way. Your tables are prepared. Let us rise. To re let us rise. <laughs> well, y'all stand up. <laughs> The body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Come forward.
with you. Join me, please, in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come with such grateful hearts, Lord. You overwhelm us because you are so good. And there is not one moment that we don't need you. And there is not one moment that you are not faithful to be there. Father, we know that in the midst of everything we are going through, even in the joy of knowing that one day we will be face to face with you, we know, Lord, that you still have a purpose and a plan for us right here to do your will, to bring you to those out into this world. But even as we go into this world, Lord, we are faced with heartache and suffering, things we do not understand. And Father, I come to you right now, and I lift up my brothers and sisters to you, Lord, in things that we may not understand, in pain and suffering that we may not see the purpose now, but we know that there is one. So Lord, we lift up our brother Steve, who's been fighting for five weeks with COVID in the ICU. We know, Lord, that your hand is upon him, and we continue to pray, Lord, that each and every moment you strengthen him, that you make his body stronger, that you fill him with your supernatural strength, Lord, and that you are with him and his family in every moment. We lift up our sister Liz Montamo to you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that she is well, even though she's in the hospital, Lord, but that you are there, that you went before her, that you prepared the way, that your hand is on her, Lord, and we thank you that you will heal her, that you will bring her home, and you will care for her every moment. And we lift up our sister Millie, Lord, we know in her pain that you were there. We know that even with the disappointing news of postponing a surgery, that you were still there in the plan. You were still there every step, and you are working it all out for that perfect date and that perfect timing. And we thank you, Lord, that you are going to strengthen her, that you're going to give her the endurance she needs. And we praise you, Lord. We praise you for baby Adeline. We praise you for an open heart surgery, and she's already home just on Tuesday. How you orchestrated and everything went so perfectly and smoothly, Lord, and we thank you that she is healing and she will heal quickly. We thank you, Lord, that you will heal every part of her and you will make her whole, and we thank you, Lord, that even at the young age that she is, that your hand is upon her and you have called her to a mighty purpose. So, Father, we come before you and we lift up everything that we have to you. Not because we have to, because we love you and we want to. We want to thank you for everything that you give us, big and small. We want to lay our lives down at the altar and be your humble servants. We want to give you what we have so you can use it and multiply it and grow it so that it'll point all to you and that you alone will get all of the glory and all of the honor because you alone deserve it. And we thank you, Lord, that you have given us the promise that one day we will get to do that at your feet. Thank you, Father, for your goodness, for your love and your gifts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you haven't had a chance to bring up your offerings, you may do so at the last song. We thank you so much for your faithfulness, for continuing to give during such a hard and difficult time. We thank you for those at home that are sending in their, their tithes and offerings. We know that it will go out into this world and God will multiply it for his purpose. So let's join together in our last hymn, number 135, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus.
And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you today, right now, and give you his peace. Amen. 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 Thank you.